We're in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields. Imagine that, on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord. Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. Help me to unpack your message to your people this day. For we praise you and thank you and commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus supports his claim. Last week I told you when he actually healed, he, he, he supported his claim. In John chapter 5, he said, John the Baptist was like a burning lamp and you were excited about his message for a little while. But I have a greater witness than John. He says, my teachings and my miracles authenticate that I am the Son of God. More importantly, Jesus said, I have spiritual witnesses of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says we're two witnesses is all that was, that was required to establish truth. So Jesus says, because you won't accept the spiritual truth that God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are my witnesses and they bear witness to everything I say, Jesus cannot lie. Okay, but because you won't expect, accept that, he says, I will give you the fact that John the Baptist was my witness and you accepted his testimony, you were excited about his message. But because it doesn't line up with what you want or what you expect, now you're joining the haters club. Amen? That's what he said. So now, it's about that time Jesus is walking through some grain fields, and it just so happens to be the Sabbath. <laughs> I don't think this is a coincidence. I think Jesus did this on purpose. And not to be insightful, not to start people and stir up controversy. Not, that's not why. I think he's trying to teach a very valuable lesson. So his disciples were hungry. Don't miss that. He's hungry. They're hungry. In fact, there's a difference between hungry and hungry. Right? We say that all the time. Hungry hurts. There's a big difference. I'm hungry. I can eat. That's not hungry. They're walking through the fields, and they're hungry. So they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. Now, we talked about the law of the Sabbath, not to work. The scripture specifically said, do not work on the Sabbath. I said, God never said you cannot work. He said, keep the Sabbath, keep it holy. That's what I said. I had to retract that statement last week. Many of you were not here. God did say you cannot work on the Sabbath. But the intent of the law was not the letter of the law that the Pharisees are, are, are pushing. It was the spirit of the law. And you say, well, what is it? And I, I shared that last week and I'll share it again. Jesus wanted, when Jesus was healing, let's see, let me back up. The law says you cannot work. And the scripture specifically says you cannot work. Your animals cannot work. Your maid, maidservant, your manservant, they cannot work. Period. You have to rest. So you say, okay, so God doesn't want work. Well, what constitutes work? The Pharisees spelled out, there's like 39 different things that they say, you cannot do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, let me ask you something. Farmers plow in the field for profit six days out of the week. You think they, they, they kind of want to plow on the seventh day too? Sure they do. To make more money. To keep them from becoming greedy, God says set aside the seventh day and made it the Sabbath so that you can rest. If a farmer on the plantation of workers, slaves, and they're all busting your hump, he's going to be forced to make them work on a Sunday too, or a Sabbath day too. The Sabbath day was designed for man to rest and to worship God. It was designed to keep people from being overworked. It was designed to keep people from becoming greedy. It was forcing them to take the time and rest. Sometimes the best thing you can do spiritually is rest. Amen? Amen. Now, you say, okay. So Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, and they're not happy about it. They keep confronting him. They're walking through the fields. So here's the question. I said, let me ask you a question, and I didn't ask the question. When you sit down to eat, <laughs> you take out your fork and your knife, and you start cutting that big, fat, juicy steak, and you're like, mm. does that work? Technically, yeah. <laughs> if I'm not supposed to work, I should just sit there like this. <laughs> and somebody else should be spoon feeding me. Amen? Technically. And my jaws, I can't even chew it, really, because that's work. Depending on how thick the steak is. Where are you going, Pastor? I'm going to stay with me. Picking grain to eat and harvesting fields are two different things. Would you not agree? They're hungry. I can't. You know what? And you know what some letter of the law, pharisaical mindset kind of thinking people, you know what they say? Well, that's their fault. They should have picked it on Saturday. They should have had it in the basket so when the Sabbath came, they could relax and just eat. They wouldn't have had to pick on 
the Sabbath day if they would have did the day before. So too bad. That's what you get. Be hungry. That's what people, I'm telling you, that's what people did. Because what they did, they actually did prepare the Sabbath day meals the day before. So they didn't have to do it. That's what they get. Lack of planning on your part don't constitute an emergency on mine. No <laughs> compassion. Who cares about the human need? You're not following the law. You see the problem? It's the heart. So the Pharisees saw them, again, haters club, and protested. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, haven't you read the scriptures? What David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law, broke the law by eating sacred loaves of bread that only priests were allowed to eat. You know what Jesus said? He's not condoning breaking the law. Again, he's going back to compassion and the human need, the spirit of the law. God didn't punish David for breaking the law and eating the bread that was only for the priest. Why? Because David's need for food was greater than keeping the law. The law, and I'm going to get to this in, a second, in just a second, that is not why the law was created. And what we have are sticklers for the law. Well, technically, and technicalities and all this other garbage, when really the law should be governed by love. I love you, Brother Dennis. This is why I don't want you to come to, 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 to my house and mow my lawn and do my dishes on the Sabbath day. I want you to take the day off. I want you to relax and worship God. Not to come behind his back and wait for him to do something. Ah, you're working on the Sabbath. You're supposed to be resting. That law is not governed by love. Right. Amen? Amen? You see the difference, church? He ate the bread, so Jesus, in essence, was saying, hey, hey, you want to condemn me? You got to condemn David. Right. You think they were going to do that? <laughs> in fact, I'm surprised they didn't stone him for that, or try to anyway. Because he says, hey, D David did it, and he's trying to draw the illustration. He's not trying to be argumentative. He's not trying to condone breaking the law. He's trying to make a point. The human need. He says, haven't you read about the law of Moses, that the priest on duty in the temple may work on Sabbath? He says, I tell you, there's one here who's even greater than the temple. Holy cow. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scriptures. I want you to show mercy and not sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. And I brought this back. Or when I said the created and the creator, Jesus Christ is the creator. Okay? And he is Lord over all, including the very rules in which he's established, the very laws that have been created. Jesus said, if you knew what it means to show mercy, not sacrifice, I covered this two weeks ago, and I'll touch on it really quick again. My daughter goes out and just breaks every, every law that I have in the house, every rule that I have in the house. And punishment, she said, which daughter? I'll leave that one up to you. So her punishment... It's to go, her punishment is to mow the lawn, throw out the trash, wash the dishes, wash the clothes, iron the clothes, and, and sweep and mop and do all that for the whole week. And she does that. And she comes back and she says, Dad, aren't you happy? Basically, it was a sacrifice all week for me to keep the punishment that you gave me. And I, I fulfilled it. Dad, I did everything you asked me to do. Are you happy now? My response would be, yes, of course I'm happy because she honored the punishment and did what she was told but my response would be even more deeper than that would be I would have been happier had you obeyed in the first place obey me the Lord wants us to love him and to love each other if the law is love amen then we're doing all right if I tell Dennis I don't want you working on the Sabbath because I love you I want you to take the day off and relax that's one thing, but sneaking behind and waiting for him to break the law so that I can condemn him is something different. That's not love at all. Amen? Now you say, what's the big deal, Pastor? The big deal is that what is true then is still true today. There is a lack of love in the fellowship. People are quick to condemn each other and throw stones. Well, did you see what he said? Did you see what he did? Why are you talking to somebody else about that person when you should be talking to them? That is the law of love. If you truly desire to correct that person and rebuke that person so that they can grow.
When Jesus said, I am Lord over the Sabbath, we were, Jesus said, and I'm going to read the other translation. I have another one here. It's in actually, it's actually, it's in Mark. And this is what Jesus said specifically. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people. The people were never made to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Catch that? The law, the, the Sabbath was created. God created the Sabbath for us to keep the farmers from overworking or for to being greedy, keeping the, the servants from being overworked and keeping us in a right relationship with him. It was never, we were never created to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for us. It goes back to heart. And that's where Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Amen? They don't like that, church. You think they like, you think the Pharisees said, oh. You think they had an aha moment? You think the, the Pharisees said, oh, why did you say so? Well, then let me get some of that grain. You think that's how it went down? I can assure you it didn't. They're like, really? This guy still thinks he's God. Chapter, same chapter, verse 9, Jesus goes, <laughs> Jesus goes over to their synagogue where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, now check this out, Haters Club, still growing, still brewing. Oh, they are festering. Notice the man with a deformed hand. The Pharisee asked Jesus, don't, <laughs> it was like a sincere question. It's a trick question. Does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. And he answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, would you wait till the next day to come get him out? He says, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would, because they ain't answering them. They're looking at him like, I hate when people answer questions with questions. Doggone it, he did it again. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? The law, and then he says, yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. The law permit, permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. I'll tell you, the law, according to the Pharisees, allowed them to, to, to work if it meant like saving a person's life. So if a person was drowning in a swimming pool, and I said, I can't use the Sabbath. The law said, okay, we can allow you to break the law by diving in and rescuing this person, but it has to be an emergency. Person's bleeding out. We need to stop the bleeding. We put a tourniquet on them. That's different. Okay, we're allowed to break the law in the event of an emergency, but Jesus said the withered hand ain't an emergency. So now you're the transition triage now. You're going to determine what's important, who's important. Amen? So Jesus, says, he comes back with the sheep. He says, hey, if your sheep falls, are you going to leave them in there? You're going to wait till tomorrow to get them? I don't think so. You're going to get them out, aren't you? And that's not an emergency. A sheep's not going to die. You can replace the sheep. Sheep's not a big deal. And how much more important is a person's life than a doggone sheep? Amen? And the Pharisees respond. You think they, you think they went, oh, it makes sense. You think they had an aha moment? I can assure you they did not. <laughs> they said, oh, okay. So Jesus, <laughs> I want to read you this other translation because this is good. This is good. <laughs> I love this stuff, church. So then verse 13 says, he said to them, hold out your hand. He says to the man, the withered hand, hold out your hand. And the man holds up his hand and it was restored just like the other one. And the Pharisees called a meeting now to plot to kill Jesus. You know what? I'm sick and tired of this dude bucking the system. We got to kill him. I can't even imagine that. Now check this out. In Mark, there's a parallel passage that says, Jesus said, Okay, in Mark, this is what the parallel passage reads. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed the man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies were watching closely, the scripture says. Watching him closely. And if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. They already had their plan. They're already laying their tracks. They're scheming and plotting. Remember, church, the scripture says nothing new under the sun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Verse 3 in Mark says this. Mark chapter 3, in case you're wondering, Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. And so the man stands in front of everyone, stand in front of the church, and then Jesus turns to his critics, the haters club, and he says, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Does it permit good deeds on the Sabbath? 
or is it a day for doing evil? That's beautiful. Because these guys are quiet. And really, it's implied that they're discussing among themselves, but really, they're thinking more about it rather than actually talking it. But Jesus is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows their evil heart. He knows their evil thoughts. So he's over here with the man with the withered hand, and he looks back, and he says, hey, come here. So the guy with the withered hand comes in front. He plops him out in front of everybody, and he says, hey, church, let me ask you a question. Does the law permit? I don't want to misquote. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? He's talking to the fan club. Or is it a day for plotting evil? <laughs> Hello? Church, I don't know your heart. God does. You sit here, you know, I don't know how you could sing. I'm a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. <laughs> I don't know how you could sing like that. Your heart's not right. I understand the human condition. I get it. But the Lord has put a song in my heart. And when I'm singing, I'm singing. I don't claim to be a singer. But I'm letting it flow. And I don't care who hears. Just like you do when you're watching the Bears lose. I mean, we're Bears game. You're like, woo! And they score, yeah! And you don't care who's watching unless you're in Green Bay. <laughs> but when you're in church, you're like, you say we love the Lord more than life itself. And you're like, sing that song, praise team. Sing it, sing it. Yeah. I'm tired. I'm going to sit right here and watch. I don't get it. So Jesus is saying, look, I don't know what's in your heart. Well, Jesus knows what's in your heart. But he's saying, hey, is it, is it the day for doing good deeds? Does it permit that? Does the Sabbath permit that? Or is it a day for plotting evil? Get right or get left. So now here's, you're probably sitting here like, man, Pastor, what is wrong with you? You're beating, you're beating this horse. Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in Mark, the scripture says, is it a day for doing good deeds? Can you do good deeds on a Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this the day to save a life? Or is it a day to destroy it? Jesus asked. And the Bible said they wouldn't answer. I presume. Is it a day to save a life? They're probably, yeah. Or is it a day to destroy it? They're like. The Bible says they didn't answer. And the subsequent verse, it says he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. When Jesus spelled all that and pointed that out, again, you thought they had an aha moment, they didn't. So Jesus said, is it a day to save a life or is it a day to destroy it? Does it permit good deeds or is it a day for plot and evil? Nobody answers. Jesus is like, well, well, and nobody answers. And the Bible says he was like, goodness gracious. The Lord Jesus was all man. Frustration and anger sets in. He's frustrated with them because they wouldn't answer him. Scheming and plotting, doing what they want to do. And he's given an opportunity to open their mouth and they choose to keep it shut. But they'll talk behind his back. They'll talk amongst themselves. They had every opportunity to confront him face to face. They chose. So what's, your, what's my point? My point is that it gets old, church. It gets old. It gets frustrating. People think that Jesus was some wimp. He's nothing, he's nothing close. As he shooed everybody out of the temple. We've seen that. People think Christians are supposed to be wimps. If you know me, I'm kind of aggressive. God has taught me a lot over the years of my life on how to rein that in so that I'm not so crazy. And part of it still escapes from time to time, you see. But I mean crazy. God has done a work in my life. Praise God. Praise God that I'm no longer that guy. But it gets old, church. And I, I think, you know, we, biblically, we know what we ought to do. 
He said, Pastor, you, you preaching to the wrong people. You need to preach to the lost that. The lost don't care about all that. You know what I've learned? You know what I've learned? You know who's going to judge us, church? We are. I'll give you a classic example. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want anybody to think I'm singling them out. But we will look at another Christian and say, they ought not do those things. They ought not say those things. We will do that in a quick minute. Now, there is some responsibility would come with being a Christian. For example, if I went to work and I sat down at the desk and I started just spouting off profanities and looking at pornography on the computer or whatever, people would come to me and say, hey, you know, even before I was a pastor, they would say, hey, you know, you, you're supposed to be a Christian. You ought not act like that. So even the world expects certain things from us. They expect us to be a certain way, and they're quick to point it out when we don't. So there is some expectation. There is responsibility that comes with us acting and being a certain way. But an example would be is if a person comes to Jesus Christ, gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ, and then you see that person stumbling out of the bar. Oh, well, hey, hey, he was just baptized four weeks ago. This guy is supposed to be a Christian, and he sure as heck shouldn't be drinking. Okay, Pharisee. If he's an alcoholic, the grace of God in his life is going to change him from the inside out. You're not his judge. Should he be in that bar drinking, stumbling out, sloppy drunk? Probably not. Okay, so just for the record, should he get that together? Yes, but it's the transforming power of God that does that, not your smart Alec remarks or your judgment. The Pharisees call the meeting now to plot to kill Jesus because they're about sick of him. Church, I'm telling you, I've said this a million times. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I say this, I say this in love, I do. I know it may not sound like it. But you can't worship God in this church and find another one. And I promise you, the next one you go to will be just jacked up. <laughs> We're broken, church. We're broken. Amen. Total depravity of mankind. That means sin has infected every part of us. Right. And you go to this church, you're oh, so sick of that, you know, all that trash talking, all this. Stuff. I'm going somewhere else. Go somewhere else. You get the, whoa, this is a beautiful place. Yeah, I love it here. Give us some time. <laughs> so you start to meet some people. <laughs> See how that works for you. If we could write our sin, if we, could just, if we had like one of those digital boards, you know, like the bulletin board out in front of somebody, if we had one of those things scrolling across your head with all the sin in your life, people, nobody wants to sit next to you. <laughs> they wouldn't. So you want to cast, I'm telling you, you want to cast stones. Take a look. My point is this, we have a responsibility to love each other. And if you're not careful, the church is divided into two groups. The fan club and the haters club. When really we should be one group, and that is devout followers, Amen. disciples of Jesus Christ and what that looks like. And you know what that means? <laughs> Submitting yourself to his will for your life. You think his will for your life is talking smack behind somebody's back? You think his will for your life is this division? You think it is or you think it's unity? Go, go, go to another church and check it out. I'm telling you. I'm encouraging you to do so. You'd be shocked. You might come back and say, hey, Pastor, we are a mess, but so are they. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He looked around angrily at them and saddened by their hearts. And then he said to the man, hold out your hand. The man held out his hand, and he was restored. And all of the Pharisees went away. This is in Mark. With the supporters of Herod to plot to kill Jesus. Next, next week, we're going to look into Jesus actually calling his 12 disciples. There's some significance there. There's some significance in the 12. And I will unpack that next week as we move in. He goes into the Sermon on the Mount as well. That's what we'll be talking about next week. I want to leave you with this, church. Which group are you in? Are you a fan? With your pom-poms, woo, go, Jesus, go. You know what the problem with fans is? They're bandwagon fans. The thing about Cub fans, they're Cub fans. When the Cubs stink, they're still piling in. They don't want to, I mean, you got to be a real fan to root for a team that hasn't won a World Series in over 100 years. Now, the Sox fans, I'm, hey, I'm a Sox fan, church. And I'll be one forever, either, and they're horrible. But that's a true fan. You ride and die with your team, okay? 
But most fans ain't like that. They'll wear the Sox shirt, they'll wear the Sox hat when they win the World Series. Here we come. You're like, where were you? Where were you in spring? That's the problem with fan clubs. They don't necessarily ride and die with their team. And you'll see that as Jesus' fan club dwindles really quickly as we move through his life. You don't want fans. Or you're over here in the haters club. And I, you know what I say? If you're in the haters club, hate. Hate all you want. Just leave. Go hate somewhere else. But you have a choice to make. Are you the legalistic one who's looking to point and condemn people? That is not the law, the law, the law of love. We love each other, love God and love each other. You really need to ask yourself. I think it was Wilson, Flip Wilson said you need to check up from the neck up to get rid of your stinking thinking. You know what happens over here? The more people talk, the group grows. So you have to make a choice. And you, church, in the covenant that you sign, agreed to squash gossip when you hear it, not entertain it. Somebody comes flap, flap, flapping, shut, tell them like Jesus told the demons, quiet. Don't want to hear it. Got a problem with brother so-and-so, go talk to him. Got a problem with sister so-and-so, go talk to him. And church, I'm telling you, church this size, that's going to happen. It's easy when we're only five deep. <laughs> There's five of us, we can love each other and sing kumbaya. <laughs> Somebody dresses a certain way, you shouldn't dress like that. Nick, stand up. Right, you're a man enough to handle this. I'm not going <laughs> to chump you out. All right, come over here. All right. All right. <laughs> Trying to get you away from my bad foot. <laughs> Just making sure you don't get me. Blue jeans, gym shoes, shirt. Maybe I'm using him as an example. He's up here leading worship. Maybe that bugs you. Too bad. I, I don't care. I, I don't know how else to say it. You're a worship leader. I don't wear a tie. You should be in a suit. He shouldn't have, you know, and I probably shouldn't be up there in bare feet with his bunions showing. You know? <laughs> but you know, we ought not have that, you know. And, you, know you're, you know what you are? You're a Pharisee. Now, if God moves in Nick's heart and next week, he decides to wear a tie and a button shirt and he starts wearing a suit, that's, that's, that's between him and the Lord. I had somebody tell me, we don't need drums. We should have drums. We shouldn't move seats. We should have kept pews. You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Seriously? You're missing it. Jesus, when he's talking about the, 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 the Old Testament system, the wineskins, remember that? And he's talking about the Sabbath and the rules and the laws. He's saying your system, listen to this, this is important. He's saying your system of worship is more important to you than worshiping God. How we do it matters more to you than what we do. How we do it. Oh, you didn't not try, Pastor. Didn't cross your T. Pastor, you need to shave. Your hair is too long. Too bad. I mean, seriously. Seriously? Seriously. You worried about somebody's beard? He can't be wearing pants, or she can't be wearing pants. He needs to be wearing a dress. And on and on it goes. We're, if, I'm telling you, church, if you're not careful, you'll find yourself over here. Call himself a Christian. What kind of pastor preaches like that? What kind of sermon was that? <laughs> I can't believe he said that. We need to be careful that our system, the way we worship, isn't more important to us than who we worship. How we worship is going to trump who we worship? I don't like the music. Hey, there's a church right down the street that probably pays, plays your kind of music. There's one right over there. I'm pretty sure they do. There's different churches right over here. One over here, and their music is a little bit different than the one over here. But I'm pretty sure if you're not happy, there's probably one over there. And maybe the pastor is a little more polished, and he's not as animated. Maybe that's your pastor. You move too much, you make me laugh too much. I'm trying to be serious. If that's the day, I'm just saying. Church, I'm trying to drive home a point here. Is the way we worship more important than who we worship? How we worship? Oh, we can't. You can't have, I had, we first learned, I learned this early in my ministry. I had a person come through those doors and say, what do you think about drums? 
I would tell you, before we launched this church, it was in Oregon, right here. An Oregon. <laughs> right here. Yep. And we need to get rid of that thing before these doors open, before anybody sees it. By show of hands, how many of you listen to organ music at home? Raise your hand. <laughs> I got a couple. We got a couple. Or maybe one or two. I don't. And quite frankly, until you raise your hand, I didn't know anybody who did. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Now, we got rid of that thing. <laughs> we, had, we had a visitor. First Sunday we launched, he came through these doors. Brother Jason, are you in here? No? He remembers that guy. He came in through here. He's old school Southern Baptist. Boy, patches on the elbows. He come in. Tight mustache. Clean cut. And then he comes up. He says, how you doing, brother? I said, I'm the pastor. He, I, honest to God, he went like this. He looked me up and down. <laughs> he looked me up and down. Like, you sure don't look like what I expected. That's what he said without saying anything. And I said, well, all right. Welcome. He sat in the back. I ain't kidding you. I stayed right here. First song, I'm doing my thing, you know, worshiping God. Turn to do the welcome. Two songs, and he gone. So I asked somebody from the back. I said, hey, when did brother so-and-so leave? They said, man, halfway through the first song. <laughs> brother Hank was here. He went, and he went, everybody up there, and he was like, whoa, no, no, no. He got out that seat, and he slipped out the door, and somebody tried to catch him, but he was gone, gone, like speedy guns out. <laughs> cloud of smoke, he was gone. I give that brother credit. He knows what he wants. He knows what he's looking for. This ain't the church for you. Praise God. And I'm pretty sure this guy was the real deal. He had a big King James Version Bible under his, I forgot to mention, it had a handle on it. It was so big. But he left. And he went to go find a church where he could worship God. Amen? That's what I'm saying. So I had another couple come in a couple weeks later, and they asked me. We didn't have drums yet. The organ's gone. What do you think about drums, Pastor? I said, I like them. Oh, I don't know about drums. I started getting emails with attachments about drums and worship and stuff. I'm like, really? Seriously? So when we got the drum set, it was an electronic one. And the first thing we did is we sat it there for a week. Nobody played it. You just sat it there so people could see it. You know how you break people? <laughs> you, got, you know, people are afraid of snakes. You put a snake in the room all the way over there in an aquarium, and then you move a little closer every time. That's the approach I took. The drum set was there one week. The next week, we let it sit there another week. The third week, we had somebody play. We kept it real low. And then we started cranking them up, and boom, look at that. A cool drum set all of a sudden. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I had this couple come in and tell me, look, pastor, we ought not have drums. We ought not have drums. And I'm going to be honest with you, church. I, I entertained the thought. Should I? Should we? And I'm thinking, and the Spirit of God told me, seriously? Drums? You worry about drums? Drums. Really? Drums. <laughs> Church, and you maybe, maybe you sit here on Sunday. Man, that's, that's too loud. Sit in the back. It's a little quieter back there. Seriously. People are, you know, I don't like the drums. I don't like, the, I don't like that. I don't, whatever it is. You know what? We, there's, there's two clubs, Church. Which one are you? Because a true disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't give a rip about drums. Doesn't. Don't care if we're in here or outside. Doesn't care if I'm wearing this jacket or not. Oh, Pastor didn't wear a suit today. He was up there in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and some slippers, some flip-flops. A true disciple of Jesus Christ can give a rip about all that foolish, inconsequential nonsense. But the fans care. They ain't winning. We ain't going. That's Sox fans. They ain't coming. It ain't air conditioners broke. I ain't coming. Oh, man, coming through. I, I ain't coming through. It was a drag. I ain't coming next week if it ain't fixed. <laughs> church, I'm telling you, these are the foolish things we're dealing with in churches today. Right. Foolish. You know why I wear a suit and tie? You want to know why? Because I like it. I do. I like wearing a suit and tie. That's why. Church. We can be crit critical, and we can judge everything and everything. And you know what? What we really should be doing is focusing on the Lord and loving and worshiping him. That's it. We spend as much time worshiping and praising God as we do criticizing other people. You'd be surprised. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of balance that comes with everything I just said. You can't just come in here and, and, and not give a rip either. Like, man, you just un undid everything you said. No, no, I didn't. If you truly love somebody, you'll put your best foot forward 
and love that person. And love is an action word. Right. Amen? Amen. See, let me close your eyes and join me in a word of prayer as the praise team comes forward. I want to challenge you to search your heart, search your mind, and ask yourself, where are you? Where are you when you walk with God? Do you love the Lord? Are you a fan of Jesus Christ? Are you a follower, a disciple? Or are you a Pharisee? Are you a hater? Choose for yourself whom you'll serve, the scripture says. You cannot serve two masters. It's going to lead us through a prayer. As I conclude our prayer, our praise team is going to play a song, and we're going to have a song of response. If you feel led of the Lord, I want to encourage you to respond as God has laid it on your heart. The Father in heaven, Lord. Father, we come before you, Lord. We come in Jesus' name, Lord. Father, I am so thankful for your word that is true and that doesn't change, Lord. It is something we can build our lives upon. Father, I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for this ministry that you've called us to. Father, I pray that your spirit would unite the hearts of those that are here, Lord. I pray that we would truly be one, a body of Christ, one unified for your glory and for your honor. Father, there's always division in churches. What's important is that we recognize it and deal with it accordingly. So, Father, I pray that through the power of your spirit, Lord, you'd give us, not just me, the pastor, but the leaders here, Lord, but every Christian has a responsibility, Lord, to love you and love each other. So, Father, if we're not acting in love, Lord, I pray that your spirit would convict us in our hearts and help us to love one another the way you love us. Help us to see each other as you see us. Not critical, waiting for somebody to make a mistake so that we can criticize. As we see the Pharisees do with the Jesus and his disciples. Father, I pray that you'd renew our hearts, Lord. Put a fire in our bellies, Lord, to love you and love others. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory and all the honor. For you're worthy of it. Lord, never robbing you of the honor and the glory that you deserve. But always giving it to you. Father, I pray that your spirit would move about this place, Lord. As we sing our response song, Lord, I pray that you move and stir the hearts of those that are here. Father, we love you and we praise you, Lord, and we commit this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.